looking for these. So full frame image sensor, what is that? So as I mentioned before, here's the image sensor. What does it mean to be full frame? It has to do with the dimensions of film. Film used to be 35 millimeters. Nobody really knew what that meant. Well, I didn't when I was growing up. But the dimensions of the actual frame of film was 35 millimeters. So now in digital cameras, we have, for some reason, they don't make them bigger, I guess cost. I think it's cost. We have full frame sensors, which are as large as this blue box, and then smaller cropped sensors. So a lot of your point and shoot cameras will have sensors that are this big. What difference does that make? Well, given a certain distance of your camera relative to the specimen, with the same lens, you'll see more or less of the specimen. So this is a, a smaller sensor than is a full frame sensor. So we want to capture as much as possible and as close to the specimen as possible. I don't know why I don't use my habit. So if you can't afford a DSLR, uh, there are some really, really reasonably priced ones in the mid-range, um, but if you can't, another option, a step, a step down or away from that might be a mirrorless interchangeable lens camera. These are becoming more popular. Some are still very expensive also. They're a lot smaller, which might make them handier to take in the field as well as part of an imaging station if you're trying to um, do more with one camera. Um, they also come with sensors that are full size and they do capture raw file format too. Um, and they come with macro lenses and we'll talk about lenses next, but macro is the one you want. And then you've got your point and shoots. If that's all you have, you may as well use it. Use what you have now. Um, there's always time, or we hope, opportunity to go back and redigitize if you need to, but you have to start somewhere. Because you never know when there will be a fire, when there will be water damage. So again, with these, you want to aim for the highest number of megapixels you can, the largest image sensor size you can, and if at all possible, to capture in raw file format, which some do. How do you know which camera is the best one? I wish I knew the answer. It all depends on your budget and your needs. One uh, really, really helpful website I find is this DP Review. And it allows you to select a whole bunch of cameras from a long list and compare them side by side for all of the features that are relevant to us with um, capturing specimen images as well as any that you might be interested in capturing field images, etc. You can compare different models, different sensor sizes, etc. So it's really helpful. Lenses. Which lens do we need? Well, I mentioned before we want to be as close to the specimen as possible because we want as much of the sensor filled with the specimen and nothing else. So we want this, we go with a macro lens because macro lens lenses have a, a short focal length and they allow us to get the subject, the size of the subject on the sensor nearly, this, nearly or more than the actual size of the subject. So a grasshopper's head here on the, grass, on the camera sensor will be the same size. Um, so these are two examples. This one's a Canon 55 millimeter. This one's a, a Sigma that can go on an Icon camera. So you don't always have to buy the name brand lens to put on your name brand camera. One thing we want to remember with regard to um, the lens and the type of image sensor we have, a 70 millimeter um, focal length with a, a smaller cropped image sensor will yield different results than one with a full frame. So you may have to adjust the height at which your camera is above the specimen according to the, the focal length and the image sensor. The focal length, yeah. So how do you know how high above your specimen you need to put your camera? And do you have a structure that will allow you to go that high or that low? There's a really handy um, calculator at this website that allows you to calculate based on the size of your herbarium sheet, the size 
of your label packet, the type of camera you have, which includes what type of sensor you have, and how, um, how far the camera is off the shooting surface. So if I know my, my copy stand or my, um, my structure upon which my camera is resting can only go as high as 27 inches off the plane, I need to make sure that I get a lens that will allow me to capture the full specimen. If I get one that captures, um, that has too long a focal length, it will capture only part of the specimen and not all of it. So copy stands. Copy stands, these are what allow you to hold the camera up above the specimen. They come pretty standardized. They have a, a square base, a column of various lengths, um, and an arm that allows you to, um, to position the camera over the specimen. So this is one that we use at New York in, in some of our imaging stations. Yeah, it's got a 40 inch column. It claims to be low vibration. It's really important that whatever uh, table your imaging station is on uh, and whatever structures you have as a part of your imaging station are steady and not vibrating because every vibration will be captured as a, it, it will be captured in your image and make it out of focus. Another type of copy stand is this one from Venture, the CopyMate 2. This one comes with lights. It's really helpful. The other one didn't. So you'd have to have lights apart from the copy stand. Um, this one has a working area 20 by 16 inches. And the lights emit a color temperature of 5200, which we knew was related to, um, with regard to the temperature of daylight. This falls within the range we're looking for. And it has a 36 inch column. So again, given uh, the height that we can bring the camera up, we need to make sure we have a lens that allows us to capture the full specimen. So here's, here's a picture of a, one of our imaging stations. So what are the pros and the cons of a copy stand? We don't know as opposed to what yet, but the pros and cons of a copy stand, it's easy to assemble right out of the box. You can adjust the lights, you can adjust the camera. Um, you run the risk of having ambient light expose your image, which could cast a pink or a blue color that you'd have to adjust for. And because the lights are not all the way around, there might be some shadows on the specimen which would obscure some of the detail on the specimen, making it less taxonomically informative. And not every, every area of the specimen well exposed. Um, what's an alternative? There's this, this is a box that emits light on all sides, except for these doors. It's called a photo e-box. We call it a light box for short. And it was originally designed to photograph jewelry. So jewelry reflects light in very beautiful ways. So um, retailers who wanted to sell jewelry would put the jewelry in these boxes and the lights would come at it from all sides. And the, uh, the information manager for digitization at New York, just prior to me, Mike Bevins, who was a photographer by trade, started working with us about three years ago, analyzed all our workflows, what we were doing, and decided that he really needed to change some things, needed to speed things up. He wanted to make sure that we could work faster, figure out where, our, where were our bottlenecks, what, what was causing us trouble. And one of those things was um, our light source. So this allowed for even illumination on all sides with a predictable color wavelength. It was self-contained. All you had to do was put it on your copy stand and you were ready to go. Easy to operate. You didn't have to train the digitizer to use it. Um, there was no need to crop. So the hole at the size of the box relative to the camera was just perfect to capture the specimen and nothing else. Um, and it's really small. It's only this big. And this is in contrast to what we had when he got there. So we had these big light sets up, set ups, this big copy stand with a really long column, which is nice for, for some types of specimens, um, but a big footprint, uneven lighting, um, and a lot of areas that could be improved. A good place to start, if this is what you have, is a good place to start. Um, but there are other options. So we have found in the same physical footprint we've been able to install several light boxes and allow for faster digitization. 
So some of the differences we see, Melissa showed this picture yesterday, uneven illumination versus even illumination, no shadows, shadows. And given the ease with which we're able to take pictures in the box, we went from 50 to 60 exposures an hour to upwards of 120. What are some of the disadvantages? It's not a perfect solution to every problem. It's limited in size. It's about 17 by 14, I want to say. It's rectangular in shape, but not big enough to accommodate every type of specimen. Plus, it's a really small company, and they've gotten more business in the last couple of years, I think, than they've seen since their inception. And so there's a little lag time between when you order the box and when you get it. And it's not cheap. It's about $1,700, and that doesn't include shipping. So it's a consideration. You may have to replace some of the bulbs. You may have to replace a fan. It's pretty common you'll have to replace bulbs with any light source, but something to keep in mind. It doesn't have doorknobs on the outside, so you have to makeshift doorknobs. And there's a little bit of assembly required, though not much. And then we have another alternative, which Alex showed us at the herbarium. One's the flatbed scanner as first used by the, by the Global Plants Initiative Project, or the, or the Latin American Plants Initiative Project, too. Um, it produces amazing images, amazing images, really, really clear, really um, big, with consistent results. Uh, and it's easy to operate again, which is key when you have people um, that you can't afford to spend a lot of time training. You need to recruit people who don't need a lot of training and give them tasks that don't require training. Some of the cons or the disadvantages is that it's a little slow. If you're scanning um, at GPI standards, it can take six minutes per scan. Um, and you're limited in what you can digitize in it. You can't digitize loose material, because it'll stick. Uh, you can't digitize three-dimensional things. Um, and there's a chance that it might be discontinued, uh, because the GPI project is nearing, nearing the end. They may not continue to, to make these available. So. So the next item in the list, the shopping list, is the computer. What do you need in your computer? You don't have to go out and buy a new computer. You just need to make sure that it has the minimum requirements to capture the images, the space on the hard drive, and the processing speed and memory to, to do everything you need it to do. So four, gig, four gigs of RAM at least, and a 500 gig hard drive would be great if it's a, an imaging workstation alone. And it's really helpful to have a large monitor to see clearly what you're doing. And I like to use a USB mouse as opposed to a touchpad if you have a laptop. And then we need to connect the camera to the power source and the camera to the computer. You can't forget that. In many cases, um, these don't come with the camera, so you might have to buy it separately. This usually does. OK, image storage space. What do you do? How big will your archive be? How many images? What's the size? How do you know what to do? You might want to go with multiple hard drives. You might want to go with optical disks. People still save things to CDs, DVDs. You can now save to Blu-rays, each one of those uh, storing more, respectively. Um, you can go to a network server space. This is kind of the big institution scenario where maybe you're part of a university and you're one department in your university and your information technology department has server space where each department has a little chunk of space they can save on the network. Try and optimize that if you can, because uh, it's a safe backup away from your physical location. And if you can't manage that, maybe it's worth considering uh, saving in the cloud. Saving um, at s some places online offer storage space for a monthly fee. I know that internet is not cheap here, and it's not always reliable, and it might take forever to upload a really large file, image file size, but when you're thinking about the long-term life of your archive and, and uh, the safety of it, you might want to consider it. So just to touch a little bit, uh, once you got all the parts, you need to put them together. In the case of our light box, uh, we have to remove the feet and do this and that. One of the things we really like to do is place a black sheet down on the shooting surface so we have a nice pretty black background behind the white specimens. And you want to make sure that your specimens are centered in the copy stand or in the light box, the light box to the copy stand. 
If you're using the, the uh, copy stand that we suggested with the light box, we had to add a little adapter to make sure that the camera extended far enough out to, to, um, to show the inside of the light box. So you may have to, to adjust things a little bit. And just to make sure you have this for future reference, if ever you have a camera like this, it's not always, in, it's not always intuitive. Um, you want to make sure that you install your image camera software on your computer before you ever connect your com computer to your camera. So in a Canon's case, the software comes with the camera, install it on the computer, go to the software website, install any updates that are there, and then once you've done that, you can connect the camera to the computer by way of a USB port. 